I first saw Uwe when I was a legislative assistant for Tom Daschle in 1990-91, and uh, he was giving testimony before the Senate Finance Committee, and I discovered then that uh, he's one of the finest uh, speakers, and I learned, starting then, to never follow immediately after Uwe when he speaks, because there's no way that one can live up to that standard of presentation. Uh, Fortunately, I've also learned through the years it's not bad to follow Sherry, because uh, she is the one person in the world that makes it look like I don't speak too quickly. And that's also very helpful. I am going to try to serve in my role here as, the, as a political scientist. I'm going to talk not so much about substance and more about process, although I have pretty strong ideas about substance as well, and some that are in agreement and, and some that are in disagreement. And what I want to do, as this title suggests, is play off of what uh, Uwe talked about last night, the cognitive dissonant American, and to give that a little context and a strategy for dealing with that, for moving forward with reform. And uh, let's see how this plays out. Uh, I would start with uh, basically three observations. One is because the American political system is so fragmented as a way of governing and a way of passing legislation, there is a real premium on what the public is thinking about these issues. You do not need the public per se to be on your side on specific policy issues in the United Kingdom because the United Kingdom has a system of government in which the majority party can do what it wants to do and it either succeeds or it doesn't. They either win the next election or they don't, but they don't have to go to the public day after day and try to persuade individuals what to believe on policy issues. As Sven Steinmo has argued, this is something we have to do very often in the United States. Uh, although the story about the failure of health care reform throughout the ages in the United States and even in, 19, in the early 1990s has many different explanations, a large part of that problem that we face is the way in which the public is addressed, the framing, the messaging, and the mobilizing of public sentiment by both sides, and in particular, as I'll talk a little bit about, the role of fear in our political system in, uh, in, in standing in the way of uh, various kinds of changes. And I think the only way to deal with these issues is to develop a fairly nuanced understanding of why, uh, where, where American values come from, American thinking comes from, and how to uh, understand that context and to develop a strategy uh, for engaging the public on this issue in a more sustained way. Context one in the layering of American values that gets to the cognitive dissonance is, of course, the historical roots that we have in a society. I'm tapping in here a little bit from uh, Jim Marone's uh, terrific book, The Democratic Wish, in which he notes that while we tend to sp- think of the United States as a country of rugged individualism, going back to Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis, published in the late 19th century, into the 19th century, that Americans are different because when we arrived here, we had this whole continent to spread out across and to take over the pass through the mountains and cross the plains and take on the, the wilds and the, all those things in, in, invested in us, uh, even more than other Anglo-Saxon countries, a sense of individual capacity in dealing with uh, the world. And this is a, this essential uh, rugged individualism. It's essential to how we think about things like uh, whether or not we're going to have social solidarity, whether or not we're going to have a sense of uh, hanging together. But as Marone points out, we also have had historically a sense of community, of coming together. Think barn raising. Think people coming to the aid of their neighbors. Uh, We also have Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman who traveled around the United States in 1831, uh, starting to, uh, came here to look at prisons, uh, but ended up writing this phenomenal book, Democracy in America, uh, that really described that society of that time, in many ways, the society of our time. And one of the things he notes is Americans of all ages, all conditions, all minds constantly unite. Not only do they have commercial and industrial associations in which all take part, but they also have a thousand other kinds. I often admire the infinite art with which the inhabitants of the United States managed to fix a common goal to the effort of many men and to get them to advance to it freely. A sense of a constant coming together. Now the one thing to note is this sense of community, this is what Marone notes, is not about turning to the state. It's not about turning to pointy-headed, egg-headed intellectuals uh, and policy wonks in the state. It's talking about coming together as people uh, that we can solve our own problems. We don't know all. We don't need all those crazy uh, nuts with PhDs. What we can do, we can do it together. Which is one of the resistances that people have in this country to the kinds of policy discourse we have. Uh, Context one, continuing the layering. Let me turn to Larry Jacobs and uh, Rob Sapiro. Uh, They have uh, articulated where Americans, contemporary Americans stand. And on the one hand, 
Americans are philosophically conservative, they say. They don't like big government. You go out and ask people in general, do you think the government should play a big role in life? Do you think there should be relatively high taxes to finance a major social welfare state? People say no, they distrust government. They don't like government. They think it's inefficient. They think it's intrusive. They think it gets in the way of that indiv rugged individualism. But you know what? They're also pragmatic liberals. They like the benefits they get from government. There's a reason why Social Security and Medicare are extremely popular programs and very difficult ch to change now that they're in place. Larry and Bob did a very interesting study many years ago in which they surveyed, had a national uh, survey of a large population, and they divide the sample in two. The first sample was asked, uh, how their, their ratings are of how well government was performing, what government did, and then a series of specific things the government did from uh, raising taxes, providing health care, all down the list. And then the other sample got the specific things the government does and asked about those things. And then the last question was evaluating uh, the role of government. In the first sample, pretty high negatives about the role of government. In the second sample, much higher favorable attitude towards government because the, the survey had reminded people of all the things the government actually does. And when, when they're reminded of what it is that they get from government, they break free of the basic philosophical sense of conservatism and anti-government and take on a more practical view of what can be provided. Now, there's a fellow named Jim Stimson who does a lot of public opinion research. Uh, and he was interested to, uh, in responding to another book by John Kingdon, who used to be on the faculty here. Is there really a way to get a sense of where Americans are in their understanding uh, or their sensibilities towards government? And what he chose to do was to go back through all the credible public opinion surveys that have been done since 1958 in which questions are always asked, use uh, something about the environment or education or healthcare, or transportation, housing, whatever it might be. And usually these questions have some uh, uh, dimension of should the government do more or should the government stay out or do less. And if you take all these questions together and create an index that goes across uh, all these years, uh, what, what he uh, uh, feels you can communicate is a sense of whether during a particular time the public is more oriented towards government action or less oriented towards government action in general. So this is the second important contextual matter to take in the, into hand, which is it really matters when you are having these discussions. If we were talking about health care reform in 1980, that was when the public in this whole period was the most conservative and the most antagonistic towards government action, and it's not surprising the public elected Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. But we're, when we had a conversation about health care reform last time, it was actually the time in which the public was much more interested in government action than that declined with the collapse of health care reform and a variety of other things that happened. And now we are in a period, although that peak will come down a little bit. This is a rolling average on a quarterly basis. We're in another period right now where people are much more open to uh, the idea of government being more active and more involved. And so there's a timing issue. So we can talk about all the constraints the public has on the role of government, but it really depends on when we're talking about it. And we're in a moment in which the general context is more favorable. Context number three about our cognitive dissonant American, and that's the individual's cognitive process. There is a duality that we face, uh, and Drew Weston has written a very interesting book called The Political Brain uh, that's about this. And one is, uh, because we've grown out of the Enlightenment, uh, and because we are policy wonks, we like to think that decision making is rational. That people take evidence, they use that evidence, they weigh the evidence, and they come to reasonable conclusions. We'd like to think that we could have forums like this and present data, and we could compel people uh, to move in certain directions in their understandings of the healthcare system and why we should or should not do certain things. And we tend to conduct a lot of our political campaigns based on this premise. But as Weston points out, we are rational, but we are also emotional. Uh, we respond to emotional signals, and sometimes those emotional signals are more effective than the rational discourse. And those, uh, I think it would be fair to say, I don't have the evidence to present in a succinct way, but I think it would be fair to say that the opponents to health care reform through the ages have turned to, f to this emotional side and not the, the rational side as much. So Harry Truman comes forward with a plan for national health insurance built on the idea of Social Security. It seems a reasonable way to bring uh, particularly working people 
people into a realm in which they'd have this added element of security. And what does the American Medical Association say? National health insurance is the keystone of the com Leninist communist state. Uh, this, if we do universal coverage, we have national health insurance before long, we will be in a communist totalitarian society. That's not playing to a rational uh, evaluation of the evidence. That's playing uh, to the emotions. And we know from uh, Kahneman to Tversky, something that Uwe mentioned uh, a bit last night from uh, their notions of prospect theory, uh, people tend to uh, weigh much more uh, potential negatives when there are uncertainties than the positives. It's much easier to get people motivated and mobilized in response to their concern about the bad things that could happen rather than the good. So one of the easy messages in healthcare reform always is, you know the status quo, you know what, you at least know what that's about. This other thing those guys are proposing could really be very disruptive and it tends to scare people. Okay. Now, I also want to say, are, is the public rational in some way? And I'm going to try to go through this very, uh, very quickly. This is a matrix of all the times we've had some version of health care reform on the agenda in the United States. 1912, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt to running, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Truman, the Nixon Four period, Carter, Clinton, and now. And these are a variety of measures uh, kind of signaling whether or not there's a problem about costs, coverage, or the consequences of uh, health care. And I won't go through it all. Just get this visual image. Uh, when we were dealing with issues in 1912, the white space means eh, we don't really know there's a problem, we don't have a measure of the problem. This light red means, well, there's a problem that's sort of indicated. And what you, what you see from this representation is it was not a profound sense that this was a fundamentally important issue that was uh, going to govern people's lives, in part because, frankly, medical care didn't do you any good in 1912. Uh, the real issue was whether or not you had financial support if you were sick uh, and could take care of your family. By the time we get to FDR, uh, we're starting to have some concerns about the uninsured, except that there's insurance is coming into being, mutual aid societies are, are into being, so there is some coverage emerging. Uh, we are getting a sense that medicine matters and it's becoming expensive, and so now that is becoming a signal, but FDR draws back, and again, many other things were going on. Uh, this was not the only issue, uh, and it certainly was not uh, essentially obvious that government needed to leap in. By Truman, at the time of Truman, you know, this was when we really had the first proposal for national health insurance. We had clear signs that medicine was important, that people weren't getting it because they didn't have health insurance, but the private sector was responding to that. Uh, between 1945 and 1951, uh, the period in which Truman was pushing this issue at all, uh, the number of people, the percentage of the population who had hospital insurance, which was the primary thing you needed, rose from 23% to 53% of the population. And if you go to look at major medical insurance, uh, which is the, the broader basis of coverage, when you move the advance of uh, 51 to 61, we went from 103,000 people with that kind of coverage to uh, something like 35 million. So in other words, the system was, without government action, responding. So yes, problem, but this is America, private sector is responding, do we really need to bring in the government? Get to Nixon Ford, you start seeing some more indications of inflation problems in healthcare, government now has health programs, Medicare and Medicaid, they're becoming more expensive, uh, we're getting greater sense that the uninsured uh, are remaining despite the progress in the private system by Carter, it's getting more obvious. By the time we get to Clinton, we got a whole bunch of problems. We now know that we are an international outlier on costs. We now know that the inflate, medical inflation is persistent at uh, two to three times the rate of underlying inflation. Government's financing of Medicare and Medicaid is out of control. Businesses, whatever the argument is about uh, who's actually paying, they perceive themselves as having a problem in politics. It's perception that matters, not reality. Individuals, although out-of-pocket expenses become a smaller part of healthcare expenditures, the, the individuals are in absolute dollar amounts paying much more on and on and down the list. We're starting to get indications that our quality in our system is not what we thought. We used to think, yeah, we got an insurance coverage problem, but people who have insurance get high quality care. Well, it turns out that's not so true. And we really didn't start to get those, those data until uh, the Clinton era. Also a sense that these other systems, as Sherry was showing in it one way, are doing better than we are. We had really first starting to have firm ambulance at that point, and if we look at now, it's a serious problem. My point here is for a long period of American history, it wasn't necessarily obvious that the public would say, yes, 
government take hold, solve these problems, because the problems didn't seem to be that severe, or they seemed to be improving. Uh, it was not until the Clinton era where that really began to change in a dramatic way. And now we're in a period in which you'd really have to be pretty lunatic, I think, to look at the evidence and say, gee, there's nothing wrong. We shouldn't uh, involve uh, a collective action of some kind. Now, uh, I'm going to present here some data from the uh, a national survey that we participated in, the Blue Sky Health Initiative at UCLA, uh, to draw, get a sense of where the public is on some thinking about health and health care. Uh, this has to do with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, I forgot I put this question in. This is one of the questions we asked also about um, uh, the employer-based system. Is it working or not? And uh, I will just flash these colors up here quickly to show you that yellow suggests uh, that it's a threat to the current healthcare system. The red is a, uh, uh, is a certain failure, and what you see is people believe that the fact that there are multiple employers in the course of work life is a threat to employer-based insurance, and maybe uh, some percentage think it's a for, uh, cause of certain failure. As you move through all these, this is pretty rational reaction on the part of the public thinking that the changes that are going on in the, in the economy, in the nature of, uh, of where jobs are located and so on, is posing real risks to the uh, employer-based health insurance system and this is indicating, in fact, I think pretty rational response on the part of the public that this uh, is a concern. Now, uh, this is... Uh uh, again, showing this, uh, uh, in a sense, rational response. When you ask the question that Uwe showed one year of, do you think the system needs just a little bit of change, or do you think it needs to either be completely rebuilt or at least major change, this is collapsing together completely rebuilt or major change. And what you see from the 1980s onward is the public pretty consistently in surveys, in surveys, is saying, you know, the system really needs major change. And, and uh, uh, some of those are even saying needs to be completely rebuilt. And this persists even through the Clinton uh, defeat. Uh, people think there's something wrong with the system, as Ufe talked about last night. It's been going on for a long time. It's a rational response to the data that I just presented. Now, the problem is we have what I call the fear arc in uh, the United States. And that is on almost any time a, a major issue is put, Truman presents a national health insurance, or Clinton presents his Health Security Act, or even uh, the Medicare Catastrophic Coverage Act uh, passed in 1990 and repealed a couple of years later, 18 months later, you get this standard pattern. Kind of high support for it as it gets energized, even more support for it, and then eventually, as the campaign goes forth, support collapse, collapses, and sometimes you go from having started at, say, 55, 60 percent, you end up at 25, 30 percent support. It's very easy to get people very scared about these changes. And this is the constant that uh, if anyone is going to succeed on health care reform, has to be confronted. This emotional, some of it's evidence-based, but a lot of it's emotionally-based fear about changing from the status quo. Now, what do you do about that? Uh, here's where you can bring in the issue of framing if you're a political scientist, and I'm going to turn to the work of Frank Gilliam, who's now the dean of our public affairs school at UCLA, and his colleague Susan Bales at the Frameworks Institute. When we go out and ask people questions, we, are, we have a question, we pose it to them, and we get some polled result of the sort I just showed you. And we can identify a certain percentage of the public believes X, Y, or Z. But underlying that is a model that people have in their heads that's a combination of their values and just how they think the world works. And once that model is activated by asking the polling question, it has a set of implications for uh, how they're going to respond to particular questions. And the important thing to know is we, all of us, we don't just have one model, we have a dominant one that's the first thing that we turn to when we're asked a question about something, but we have other models. And they can be quite different. They can be part of this cognitive dissonance. They can have, we, we bring in, a, we might be tapped into bringing in a different value that we also hold dear, or a different understanding of how the world works. So strategically, in terms of process, the question is, which model out there among the public is the one that's being activated at any particular time in campaigns for reform? Now, uh, Frank Gilliam and Susan Bales argue that Right now, we are dealing, they say, in much of the work they've done around the country, that very often it's the consumer model that gets activated. So when people are asked about health care, they're arguing, very often they're turning to, well, we're a free market economy. I buy cards in the market. I buy toasters in the market. I buy health insurance from the market, private insurers in the marketplace. So I think in terms of markets. And if I think in terms of markets, it means it's a private good. Uh, my main concern is my personal cost issue.
issue, not how much the country is paying for health care. Uh, and the, and the, as Bob Blendon says, the basic theme is, first thing off, do me no harm. Don't, don't make me worse off by trying to uh, uh, bring about health care reform. But uh, uh, Bales and Gill Gilliam have also found that if you uh, introduce different information and ideas to people, that they activate different kinds of models. For instance, people get an understanding that, you know, health care is different. We don't, we, there's great interdependency. Uh, in some ways, people are connected to one another. Uh, we need an infrastructure to make the system work. It's, the current system's inefficient. They use this analogy. It's kind of like the system we have today is kind of like having individual wells, in, individual septic systems that were, you know, <laughs> whereas everything else in the world is now connected and integrated and modernized. We've got a healthcare system that is uh, in this old fashioned uh, rural motif of 19th century America. And that doesn't make much, much sense. And we can also, we can go on down the line. There also uh, is an understanding of the potentials of, of prevention, that maybe it's better to stay healthy in the first place rather than have to go into the medical system. Uh, maybe, in fact, if other people are healthier, I will be healthier because I live in a community where people will be affected. And uh, is there any evidence to suggest this might be the case? This is where I get to the Blue Sky Health Initiative's question in 2006. This was a question we asked, let me just read it to you because it's important to get the details. People have different views of what affects their own health and the health of their families. Some people believe that health is an individual matter determined by their own preferences, decisions, and actions. We're on our own. Let's say that they are one on a five-point scale. The other people, believe, other people believe that health is a community matter with their own health affected by the health and well-being of others. Quote, unquote, we're in this together. Put them on a five on a five-point scale. What did the data look like when we asked this question? Only 11% were in that hard category of it's all me, boy. I did, it's what I decide to do, it's my preferences, it's all my actions. Uh, the rest of the respondents are spread out with some combination of individual and, uh, and uh, overall community. Uh, and you might say that this 11 percent are the really, truly rugged individualists who think nothing else matters but their own de decisions and choices. We also asked about health care services and gave people some analogies to work from. When you consider the best way to think about healthcare services provided by doctors, nurses, and other health professionals, clinics, hospitals, et cetera, which one of the following three statements comes closest to your own opinion? Healthcare services are private goods that people should buy, somewhat like cars and televisions, and based on what they can afford. Basic healthcare services are, are, should be available to everyone, like public education, but people who can afford it, uh, afford to, should be able to buy more or better care, similar to paying for private schools. Or all effective healthcare services should be universally available, provided to everyone as a right of citizenship and based on the services they need. And what we find here is, again, only 11% are defining healthcare services as a private good that should be left entirely to the market and based on what you can afford to pay. About half uh, think it should be a right of citizenship. That's a lot lower than it would be in Sweden or Canada and other countries. But on the other hand, uh, a pretty significant number think it should be like public education. Remember, in the United States, public education is where 85% of the population gets its education. It's kind of comparable to how many people are in the insurance system and in, in, uh, the government uh, overseeing insurance system in Germany. So in a way, uh, put those two together, and we've got quite significant sense that something should be done at a significant base uh, that uh, would be oriented towards uh, a, a, a more uh, larger government and larger social role. Now, to be strategic, people need to know how, in communicating with people, they need to have these ideas triggered in a way that brings up the kinds of uh, underlying values and models that will move this kind of issue forward. And this is being, uh, going back to George Lakoff, a, uh, 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 who's in uh, uh, linguistics at um, uh, Berkeley, and it's become quite a, a popular figure in politics now, in my, by my taste, a too popular figure in, in politics. But uh, nonetheless, the core ideas here are important, and that is he has three levels. Level one is talking about the big ideas, freedom, individual rights and responsibilities, justice, prevention, equality, security, and opportunity, and so on. Then you talk about after you have kind of these big ideas, what, are, what are issue area are you in? And of course, the issue area we're in here is healthcare. And then you get to the, the level three, which are specific proposals and, for instance, an individual health insurance mandate or a single payer, whatever you might want to call it. The problem in American politics, given the role and importance of the public in the system, is that we tend to have all the debate at level three and not really at level one. 
And to put it more starkly, Democrats have the debate at level three, and Republicans and conservatives are very good about keeping it at level one. And so as long as people, as long as conservatives are very effective at making an argument about individual responsibility, about thinking in terms of the, of the market and individual freedom, it's very hard to penetrate down. And if too many reform proponents think you've got to argue about the details at level three, and that somehow the public will add it all up into how it will resonate with their own core values. This is in many ways the point that Sherry's making. All that stuff doesn't matter. It's the fundamental issue of, of uh, security, the fundamental issue of, of uh, in some ways, justice, fundamental issues of getting people into the insurance system, uh, uh, per se, and not those details. And it just doesn't work to build up from the bottom. You've got to start at the top. Now, let me uh, try to close going back to some of my core uh, areas of, uh, of work and to compare the 1990s to the current period. Uh, and here I will take a little issue with Sherry uh, and others on how to proceed at this point, and that's to set, understand really the nature of the, of the political context. This goes back to my work from Legislating Together, looking at domestic policy making by the President and Congress over a long period of time and what creates conflict between the institutions, what creates opportunities for legislative success. Take the institutional con uh, context. We have a constitutional structure that's fairly stable, but those institutions within it really change quite a bit. The Congress over a period of time, take the House of Representatives, sometimes it's a very centralized institution, sometimes it's a, a more decentralized one or focused on committee power, and sometimes it's a highly fragmented institution. In the recent periods, it's become a very centralized institution. Thanks to Newt Gingrich and the Republicans who came in in 1995, there are a whole set of rules now that are now not only in place, but actually activated uh, that allow the leadership of the House to really wrest control of the agenda and how things proceed in a way that was not true in the 1970s, for instance. Take interest groups. The interest group community changes a lot. For a very long time, there was a very solid anti-reform alliance of organized medicine, hospitals, employers, and insurers. That really broke apart going into the 1990s. Bill Clinton had an unbelievable opportunity to create new coalitions and frankly just blew it. Uh, and I have data from surveys of these groups about uh, just how badly uh, they blew it. There's now a new period, as Sherry mentioned, in which all kinds of new alliances seem to be forming much uh, greater opportunities for uh, perhaps putting together things in a way that we couldn't possibly have done in the past. The political context, the presidential election, take 1992 versus 2008. 1992, Bill Clinton won with 43% of the popular vote, the lowest since 1912 uh, when Woodrow Wilson came in uh, to office. Uh, he uh, ran behind almost everybody, every Democrat who was running for Congress. Uh, Obama won 53% of a 10 percentage point difference, but there's another broader context to bring here. Look at presidents coming into office for the first time, and it's, this is their first election. You have to go back to 1952 to find a president in the first election that got more percentage of the popular vote than Obama did. That was Dwight Eisenhower, 55% of the vote. For a Democrat, you have to go back to 1932, uh, when Roosevelt came in, uh, uh, in in the midst of the Great Depression, not pre-Depression, <laughs> but in the midst of the Great Depression, when he got 57% of the vote. So that 53% is actually more significant than it may seem, both in contrast to Bill Clinton and in contrast to um, other periods of history. How about the congressional election returns? In 1992, the Democrats in the House of Representatives when Bill Clinton was elected lost nine seats. In this election, Obama comes in and the Democrats picked up 21 seats. If you look at the two, year, the two election cycles going back to 1990 and 2006, uh, there was a net loss of two seats for the Democrats in the House uh, uh, by the time Clinton came into office for Obama. It's a net gain of 52 seats. It's a very dramatic difference. Look at the Senate. No change in 92. Uh, 90, there was a net gain of one seat for the Democrats. In 2008, uh, there was a gain of, it looks like, <laughs> we're still not settled, uh, it looks like it might be a gain of uh, eight seats, and there were five in the last election. That's a, a gain of 13 seats. These are contextual things that really profoundly, fundamentally matter, and here's something that you cannot put a measure on. The Republicans demonstrated when they won the Senate in 1986, and again when they won the House and the Senate back again in 1994, that when you are a new majority coming in, 
you are energized in a very different way than you are if you've been around for a long time. When Bill Clinton came in, the Democrats had controlled the House for 40 years. They had become fat, they had become lazy. They thought they were in power forever. They were complacent, and they got whomped. Uh, eventually in 1994. When new majorities come in, they want to hang together, they want to get things done, they tend to like to, uh, as much as possible, stick together with th their president. We'll see whether that happens or not, but there's a, just a different psychology uh, this time. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about public opinion. The economic context. In 1992, there were deficits, and when you have deficits, you have a zero-sum problem. Anything you try to do new uh, will be taking money away from somebody else's program or taking tax dollars out of people's pockets or taking future tax dollars out of future generations. That makes, that makes it very hard and very often people say, well, we'll do universal coverage when we can pay for it. Well, you might say 2008, but gee whiz, the question came to Sherry. <laughs> we've, got, are we, we've got deficits. Doesn't this create the same dynamic? We are in a situation now that it's really a crisis mode. It's not just having deficits, it's a crisis mode. And when you go back through American history and you think the big things have happened, they've tended to happen either when there's supreme consensus and lots of money flowing in, this was true in 1965, or when you have the kind of profound crisis that throws everything out the window. So you've got Republican and conservative economists today along with liberal and democratic ones saying we've got to spend big, we have to have big deficits. And the question is whether health care will be viewed as something at the margin that can now be added on because we've let all the rules go by the wayside, whether it's part of economic uh, recovery over the long term. If it can be framed in those terms, it's a capacity uh, perhaps to use this, uh, this, this difficult economic time to advantage. The policy context. Health care reform invariably will require some kind of regulation and some kind of redistribution. Those are very conflictual kinds of policies. There's no way to get around that. This is not going to, Tom Daschle said he'd like to have a 90 percent, 90 votes in the Senate. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Uh, there's no way you can pass any kind of meaningful reform, even a pathway to reform in incremental steps that would get those kinds of votes. It's going to come down to relatively close uh, majorities. The question is, can they hold on to enough uh, folks in the Senate to avoid uh, potential filibuster and it will the, the political climate make it possible make it impossible for someone to filibuster because it would simply be too contrary to where the public wants to go. But that is going to be a very difficult point. Finally, presidential leadership. This matters at the margin, I would argue, but it matters. And look at the difference between Clinton and Obama. Clinton put into place Hillary Clinton and Ira Magaziner to run health care reform. Two people who, uh, when they began, could have not, couldn't have known less about the issue and had absolutely no political connections. And throw in Magaziner, <laughs> <laughs> disadvantaged, shall we say, in human interaction. <laughs> and now we have uh, coming in with Obama, Tom Daschle, who will be both overseeing HHS and directing uh, the health care reform effort uh, at the White House, someone who knows these issues cold and who is a, a very uh, effective uh, have from his time as majority and major minority leader in the Senate, very effective at building these coalitions. And just a very different kind of change in signaling. Uh, I'm going to stop there and open up to questions. Thank you for your talk. I do see a lot of, uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, similarities between Clinton and Obama, both charismatic speakers leadership-wise. Both are having both houses of Congress and Democrats, though in all fairness, there are actually more Democrats in, in, in the House coming in uh, for 1993. Actually, it's almost exactly the same number. Slightly more. No, it's a, a, a one or two off. That's no more than that. But the point is, that the similarities are all there. What's different now is, like 1932, we are in a crisis mode. Mm -hmm. Where, what, what the media, what the message has to be, in order to refute the, uh, you know, Hamity and and Rush Limbaugh types, who are going to scare people, is we need to have said that in our health care system, during this crisis mode, where many people with health insurance are upset because their health insurance, they found out, does not cover everything. And we need to, um, you know, it is about insecurity. I think yeah. if we can get that message across, we can stop the people who are trying to stop it by saying it's so right. Let, let me say a couple of things uh, and, and to play a little bit uh, more off of Sherry as well uh, and your point. 
One is with the economic downturn, as she mentioned, more people are going to be losing their jobs. There's going to be more at risk in terms of insurance. The one thing that Sherry didn't mention is even before the economic crisis, as you're pointing out, a lot of people had insurance that really wasn't very effective insurance. And they're finding that out more as costs are going up. And the question, if you put the two things together and they expand, it could make it harder. Now, the one thing, one thing that happened in 1993 is we also had an economic recession of sorts. People did lose jobs. People did lose uh, health coverage. And a lot of the middle class was worried that they might be moving in that direction. And then the economy picked up. And when the economy picked up, that worry tended to dissipate. It, okay, it wasn't so bad. Maybe I'm not going to lose my job. I won't lose my health care. If we have a longer, deeper recession, you have a longer period of that kind of insecurity, which could help uh, feed uh, uh, some kind of action of the sort. And it's very obviously looking very much like we're going to have a much deeper, longer uh, recession than we had in the early 19, late 80s, early 1990s. Catherine. I really like level one, two, three. And it makes me wonder, if you go back to the Nixon era, a lot of people now talk about the fact that if we had half what he proposed, we'd have even more coverage. But the experts, the John King, an expert down the surf floor waiting for the wave to carry us into the beach, we all squabbled and squabbled, as Sherry was saying about, what, oh, no, no, we, we said the doctor should be this. And we were, I'm wondering if from what you're saying, you think that the wave is coming in, but we should, the experts should dive off the surf boards and just shut up? I'm not sure I would subject all the experts to the sharks in the water uh, and leave them behind, but I do think that we, we need to understand that we have to connect at this level one with the, with the public. And when the discussion is always about the nitty gritty details about policy, we lose people. They don't connect those details back to what it really means for me and my, my big ideas and understandings. <laughs> Should act like Republicans, you're yes. Republicans do level one really well. well, and look at the Obama campaign. Now, it got tiresome after a while, but one of the things that Obama was truly, really trying to do was not have uh, the debates about Section 3 t of Title II of what I'm proposing, but we need change. We need to think of things differently. We need to connect to where the average American is. We need to think about the middle class. That was all a way of trying to connect at a higher level and avoid. Uh, the worst debate that the Democrats had during the campaign was a debate where Hillary Clinton and Obama were the only ones on the stage, and all they talked about were the health care plan, because Hillary was operating. She thought you win elections on level three. Obama understood you win elections on level one, but he was being drawn into that level three debate. That, was a, that could have been a disaster uh, for moving this kind of issue forward. Yes, Jill. So I'm not sure how to square this with Bob Lennon's work after the, the Clinton debacle. What, what he said is that there was widespread support for health reform, but a third of the population wanted universal care, and a third wanted something like HSAs, and a third wanted advantage competition, even though I can't imagine anyone doing what that was. Right. Uh, so how do you keep the public from I think that's a very good question, that, and it really is where the tension is. I, I would say that Bob, in general, tends, uh, and this is where I want to push these issues of times really matter, context really matter, that uh, Bob, because he's got his finger on the pulse all the time, is constantly paying attention to the heartbeat, if you will. And that may uh, cause you to miss what's happening in the larger organism in which that heartbeat has, has meaning. And so I, I think he, would, he tends to look at um, uh, the very immediate things. And, and I, in, in that particular case, part of what he's responding to was how the debate was framed. The debate was framed in those terms and then into got to great details. And, and to give you an example, uh, when the Clinton Health Care Plan, the Health Security Act, was put forward, it first was very popular. Then Clinton started to become unpopular. And when surveyors asked two different questions, they would ask, do you agree with the following provisions in the Clinton Health Security Act, employer mandate, da 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 No. Then they'd ask another part of the sample, do you agree with a health care plan that would have the following attributes? Yes. It was, it was the Clinton 
connection at that point had gone from being a positive to being a negative. So you didn't really have any real information about where people were on health care uh, on those specifics because you had to have the context for what it really meant. And as you say, most people don't have, they wouldn't know what managed competition is. And telling, giving them five sentences or th five lines or three lines or two lines in a question is not going to provide enough information. So I don't think that tells you a lot, frankly, when you're really talking about how the opportunities for developing a strategy to move the public along in a big way. It's not irrelevant. It's important information. And Bob gives us more information than anybody else in the world does on where the public stands on these issues. But I think you do have to have this larger context. You focused a lot at the federal level, but we all know there's a lot going on at the state level, too, and I think the three levels matter there as well. But I'm just wondering if you can give us some of your predictions about what do you think is going to happen at the states? So there's a lot of reform already in place, a lot of discourse and talk about it. Do you think that, and one core issue, too, is um, should the federal government <coughs> for the whole country, should we let states experiment and tailor and do their own thing? So how do you think this is going to play out federal versus state reform? Uh, it's a great, a great question. If I really had an answer, then I'd, I'd be able to make a lot of money on the speaker circuit. Uh, a couple of things. One is uh, the states are really hurting now even more than the federal government in many ways. And they're more highly constrained. They can't print money. Uh, they can't do things that we are doing now. And so to, any, to the extent that anything costs money, they're going to be in fall, kind of pulling away, I think, over the next couple of years rather than advancing forward. Uh, ultimately, a reform system would save money if done intelligently, but you're not gonna ha that's not going to happen in anyone's short term. And so they're facing a pretty short term crisis. And there, the, federal, the biggest thing the federal government can do is pick up more of the tab of Medicaid and provide and really save the states from uh, uh, economic uh, collapse, like California, for instance, would be really nice. Uh, there are a lot of ideas coming out of the states that I think will come into the debate. Massachusetts, which I have my own problems with, but nonetheless, it's the one place where something actually has happened that's made significant difference in coverage, and some of those ideas are going to come forward. Uh, but the third thing I would say is also, and here's a little bit where I would be probably different, um, very, very similar to, but in a different way from, say, Sherry, which is you've got to have fallback positions. Clintons did not have a fallback position, and they lost everything because they couldn't move off of what they proposed to what you're going to get out of the at context as it emerges. You can imagine a series of fallback positions, that one of which would be to fall back on the states and provide them an opportunity to run with the ball uh, if the federal government's not going to do it. And so maybe one thing that will happen is, is releasing the states from certain Medicare provisions and Medicaid provisions and allowing them to put money together in their own terms. And gee, this is America, federalism, why, not, why don't we do that? And so that would be one way in which the states, I think, would get reengaged as we come out of the recession, one hopes, and uh, if, if we don't move more at the uh, Washington level on health care reform. Maybe just can I have one more question? Yes. Just. So, so uh, as a political scientist, I mean, one of the things that I, for you as a political scientist, not me, but uh, about this election that I thought was actually quite different and novel than it was in politics was the ability to mobilize people uh, for raising money. Now, so Obama has got this right. goal line, and Dashiell has got the goal line, that if they get the message and they mobilize the pressure on the GDA, there has never been a time like this, and they've got it, and the Republicans do and they've got short term money to use it. And I just wonder what you think about that. As a, I, I, I can't believe that it would it's a terrific question. I, I meant to actually touch on it a little bit, but skipped over it. Um, this is very unusual. The Obama campaign uh, was not only one of the most effective in American history as a campaign, but it was the first to really grab hold of all the technological capacity at the moment uh, to seize the moment. And they really understand that. And to give you a, a broader context, when I, some of the interviewing I did many years ago, uh, uh, I was talking to uh, Paul Wellstone, obviously before he died in a plane crash. And Wellstone felt that one of the serious reasons why health care reform is not advanced in the United States, including the 1990s, is that there just hasn't been an effective grassroots level social movement based uh, energy that could be developed. Now, in some senses, people in the 1990s did understand that, and the whole reason of trying to build a coalition with citizen action and a variety of other of the new groups that had emerged out of the 60s and 70s was that they had the grassroots capability, but they came up with a plan that they couldn't explain to the leaders of those groups, much less to their, their, their activists, and so that they kind of lost the capacity to mobilize that grassroots. Obama has it, and, and, and they know about it, and they've set up 
change.gov as a way to try to start uh, uh, mobilizing that. We don't know whether this is going to be effective or not, but there are a lot of people out there who are waiting to be called into action on this. And we'll see whether, A, they use it effectively, and B, whether it makes any difference whatsoever in the politics. Mm -hmm.